Hero Talents Has the war within found its first major controversy even before Alpha is out? Well let's find out along with all the other big news from Azeroth this week. Blizzard have released another 8 more Hero Talent previews taking us up to 16 sets being shared by now. That means we're getting close to the halfway point. The new sets include options for Druids, Evokers, Paladins, Rogues, Warlocks and Warriors. There's a list on screen now. I won't be diving deep into the weeds of these in this week's news episode but for my main specialisation, Protection Paladin, the new Templar Paladin preview looks a lot more interesting to me playstyle wise than the previous Lightsmith did. At this early stage, I just have to hope that once these are tuned this new option will be viable and I won't end up feeling forced into my less favourite option. Something that's always going to be a worry in the current era of WoW. And this is the main story of the Halo talent so far. Overall they're very mixed with some looking genuinely awesome in terms of playability and what they add to a character's ability lineups and others well not so much. But that's not where the real community discussion lies. In the last couple of weeks, the community has become a lot more focused in the overall concept of the hero talents themselves. And I think it's fair to say there's a fair bit of disappointment that the hero talents haven't been leaning a lot harder into specific class fantasies. Speaking for myself, what we've seen is broadly what I was led to expect from the BlizzCon announcement. But I do think that the dev team's decision to give many of these sets very evocative names, like for example Dark Ranger, along with the term hero talents has triggered a pent up desire within the player base to see a lot more depth and class ability customization. Now we haven't yet seen the visuals for these talents but for many such as Dark Ranger there's a genuine expectation that they won't deliver the deeper class fantasies that many players yearn for. I suspect that given video game development in generally takes a very long time that it's already too late in the dev cycle for Blizzard to pivot for the war within at least in the overall concept but hopefully Blizzard will nevertheless take note of the strength of the desire within the player base for them to lean a lot harder into class fantasy customization for the future, perhaps even as a mid-expansion patch edition. Well, we can hope. In the meantime, Blizzard are still looking for feedback on the specifics of the trees and their abilities, and if you have strong thoughts about that site, I do encourage you to dive over to the World of Warcraft forums and add some more feedback. I'll put some links in the description for the previews. With the start of a new month on Friday, we get an all new trading post lineup. This month's post theme is Green is Good, with a ton of green themed rewards, and apparently the folks at Bliss are having a few troubles telling the difference between green and blue. Who would have thought? As this is already out in game and you can check it out for yourselves, I'm not going to run through all of the new offerings, but for me the highlight was this month's new mount, the Majestic Azure Peafill. This is a completely new mount model and Majestic is the right name for it, I'm really enjoying it. This is available for the bargain price of only 750 tendies. The monthly reward this time around is a new mouse pet called Teal. Overall, excluding the mount, this month's post isn't as strong as last month's for me, but honestly, February's was always going to be an impossible bar to live up to. Sadly, we also didn't see a continuation of the extra 500 bonus tendies we got last month, and it's disappointing to see us return back down to the baseline 100 per month. Albeit, I will say that the pricing this month for the new items does seem to have been dialed a bit closer back to where we saw when the post first launched and that does make it quite welcome. But what about you? What's your favourite reward from the trading post? Do you have thousands of unspent tendies or is it really painful only being able to buy one or two items every month? Do let me know in the comments down below. Now for those of you who like a freebie and who also have an Amazon Prime subscription, this month's Prime Graming item is the Tabard of the Frost. This is a format TCG item which is a recolor of a few other tabards that are available in game. So if you want to create, complete your collection, make sure you do remember to pick this up before the promo ends on March the 26th. I'll put a link down in the description below. Fans of Classic haven't been left out of the news this week either with the launch of the Classic Hardcore Self Found Mode on Thursday. If you want to re-experience the tension and constant threat of losing your character forever but now with it only being supported by what items you can find with trading in the auction house disabled, now's your chance. 
Over the season of Discovery, something that's been causing a fair bit of concern for the community was the announcement via an interview in Dextero that at max level 40 man raiding will remain a thing. With the new lower level raids having been designed around 10 player raiding, a lot of the community had to express concern about how they could scale their 10 man raid teams and guilds up to 40 man. Now, I don't know about you, but I've certainly experienced a couple of times over the years the effect of having either a guild merge or significantly expand their membership and the impact that can have on the team's culture and I'm sure I'm not the only one that's seen a raid team fall apart as it failed to navigate that challenge so I think those concerns from the community are very well founded. These haven't been lost on the Classic team and happily WoW Classic producer Agrend was characteristically quick to jump in and respond announcing that the level 50 raid in phase 3 and also the max level Molten Core raids will be 20 max and raid. He also shared that the team are internally discussing how and if they can adapt the other raid size wise, sharing that while the team are concerned about the potential difficulty of trying to scale all of the big raids down, they have launched an investigation to see what they can do on that front. This wasn't the only news. In the same update, a grand announced that the current X P buff in Season of Discovery will, with this coming reset, be expanded from 50% to 100% for levels 1 to 39 players, along with an increase in base gold rewards from quests for sub-level 40 characters and a reduction in mount costs, something that will definitely be welcome with the increased leveling speed. Finally, on the classic front, the team revealed that they are hatching up some plans to revamp dungeon and raid itemization at level 60 once that eventually becomes available in a season of discovery. Now, Cataclysm Classic also popped into the news with the data mining community noticing that the Battle.net catalogue has been updated to include the beta for Cataclysm Classic. This is basically the back-end change that's needed for the launcher to support the Cata beta and is one of the last things that tends to be done before a new game version makes it out to the public. There's no word on when it will go live yet, but it's fairly reasonable to think that it's going to turn up in the next few weeks. Now, moving away from the game for the last news item, Blizzard provided an update that they will soon be sending out the invites for the 2024 WoW Community Council and also confirmed that in the coming weeks, to use their words, we'll be seeing a reopening of the PTR and some new reveals from the team. While this is really good to hear, this announcement only came in response to a Community Council thread expressing concern about the current activity from Blizzard in the Council and their response was followed by quite a few members of the council expressing some disappointment with the recent interactions. Now, from the perspective of a player looking in in the council, seeing the members providing that kind of feedback is very disappointing but not surprising. While Blizzard's engagement with the council has improved quite a bit from the first year, where they at least appeared to forget about it for long periods, all of the engagement I do see has been very one way with basically occasional responses from Blizzard to direct questions. This one way vibe also applies to the developer chats with the community council, which always seem to use a QA format very similar to other dev QAs. While it's great to get updates from the devs, I feel that a community council should be more about Blizzard actively soliciting feedback from folks who often represent a broader slice of the player base than content creators and high end players do. Blizzard have a few times alluded to the idea of a silent majority who often go unheard of in the game, and the council could have been a great way for them to tease that feedback out if only they were prepared to go and seek it. A great example of this issue was a developer chat where the trading post came up. One bit of feedback was asking for a preview of the post. I recall the dev suggesting a day or two beforehand as, as an idea for a preview to the council and the council rightly pointed out that it would be a lot better to give more than just one or two days notice. Despite that feedback, the devs then went ahead with the one to two days notice without even looping around and given a reason for why more notice wasn't possible. As an outsider looking in, I don't know if there's more behind the scenes with the community council, but appearance wise, honestly, I don't think it's a great look for Blizzard. We've all, I'm sure, have been told a few times over our lives how it's not just enough to listen to feedback, 
to, to earn trust, it's also very important to be seen, to be listening to it. And right now, when it comes to the less vocal parts of the community, Blizzard just aren't doing that in a convincing way. And this is creating at least what is an impression that the community doesn't really have much of an impact. Now, to be clear, this isn't down to the community council members. It's entirely a reflection in how Blizzard are engaging with the council. With us being in the cusp of the war within Alpha and Beaters, we'll soon be in the peak season for feedback for and developer comms, and I would love to see Blizzard take this opportunity to raise the bar in how they engage with the new community council. This would help them avoid what often seems to happen in the modern area, where the entire player discourse around WoW just becomes driven largely by content creators like myself. Well, that's all the news this week, but before I drop off, I'd like to say a huge thanks to all of you who have watched this far in. My channel's now just two months old, and after a very slow start, in the last couple of weeks, I've been seeing a big pickup in growth, both in terms of viewers and subscribers. Now, that growth is all thanks to those of you who watch the videos right through and interact with them through commenting, subscribing, or hitting that like icon. This gives both me, but also YouTube, very positive signals, which help the channel reach out to even more viewers. If you haven't already subscribed and want to see more of these videos, do hit that subscribe icon and the bell down below. That way you'll be notified when the videos go live. And if you've enjoyed this video, also do hit that like icon. It helps more than you could possibly imagine. But for now, thanks for watching and I will see you all again soon.